Welcome to Pros and Cons, a podcast by writers for writers, brought to you by Precipice Fiction. Precipice Fiction would like to acknowledge the people of the Eora and Dorag Nations as the original custodians and storytellers of the land this podcast was created on. Welcome to the Pros and Cons podcast. Um, I'll be hosting today. I'm James Healy, and I would like to introduce the rest of the team. Today, joining me is Ali Burnham. Hello. Alex Eldridge. Hiya. Phoenix Rag. Hello. Paddy Boylan. Ahoy. And Matan Atoll. Hi. Full house. Today, we're going to be talking about stories with messages. Stories that have something to impart, either a concept or moral. A lesson that the author wishes to convey through the actions and events of the story. Not to be confused with team, which is kind of the broader subject that the story is dealing with, but a more specific message that is delivered through the telling of the story. It is often the purpose for the author to write the story in the first place, the central point that they wanted to communicate. But first, I wanted to ask, does everyone here feel like stories need a message, moral or lesson? What do you guys think? And what are you reading at the moment? What have you read recently? And did they have messages and morals in them? Alex? I kind of think about this a lot, actually. Whether it's something needs like a message, an explicit like, hey, this is what I'm trying to say about this. And I used to think that you couldn't really make a great piece of literature without it having some form of, hey, you can take this from it. Um, but now that I think about it, one of my favorite books, and I think I've mentioned it a couple of times before, is uh, Richard Russo's Empire Falls, which is literally just like a literary thing about some stuff that happens in a town. There's a big cataclysmic event at the end. and it doesn't like, you know, there's got a lot of commentary on uh, how people react just in terms of, you know, showing how they are, but it doesn't actually have a message. So I'd say it's not absolutely imperative, but it definitely can improve certain novels. Okay. How about yourself, Patty? Did you have something to say? Oh, yes. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> absolutely. To the question, does it need a moral? Like, no, no. One novel that comes to mind is Patrick Rothfuss. Was it The Way of Kings? No. <laughs> you should notice. God, no, what was the name, it was the name of the wind. wind. Right. All right. <laughs> you Look, it's been a while. <laughs> it's, it's not, it's My not visceral knee-jerk reaction. <laughs> I'm, sorry. Wow. I'm really sorry. Wow. And I, I did love it, but um, apparently I didn't take it in at all. So take what I say with a grain of salt. Like, there's no message. I mean, you could, if you strain, you can find a message in any text, right? You can say, this text is about this, this text is about that. But ultimately, it's a rollicking good adventure. And that's fine. Like, no one needs to feel guilty about enjoying that. It's just a really good time. But I personally love stories with messages. Why are you totally disagreeing with Tom? <laughs> and, and I, uh, yeah. I know. I just, I just think I'm going to I'm, I'm gonna let you finish. That's it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> loving this. <laughs> but um, I love things with messages. And sometimes it just gives like another really rich layer to the text. You can read the words on the page, but then all the words that aren't on the page are there in the background. It makes this lovely, like, meta situation. It's such a gross word to use now, but whatever, I'm going to say it. <laughs> so no but is my answer. They're, they're ruining the words. <laughs> <laughs> Please take apart what I just said. <laughs> I'll, just, I'll just give a disclaimer and say that Patty is a freaking genius and he's an amazing writer and I get behind That's not true. everything he usually says. Um, <laughs> I'll say this, I think to me personally, and I'm not, it's funny because I made a big deal, but I'm not actually going to disagree with you. But to me, a message or a theme is inherently tied to a conflict. Once a story has a conflict, to me, there's your message. Because the way the characters resolve the conflict is almost like the author's way of saying, this is my message. This is how you resolve conflicts or how you shouldn't resolve conflicts. That's basically, to me, usually where you'll find the message. If the way to resolve conflict is to just be more competent than the other side, that's the message. If it's to be honest, to be caring, to use uh, support, that's where I see the message. In name of the wind, I guess you could argue the message is that, hey, if you're just born like a generational genius in everything, you're going to be all right in life. <laughs> but he also tells you about... <laughs> Ali's laughing, but it's also a bit about humility that he learns to find and learning to trust other people. But I can see why Name of the Wind be brought up as a unique story in terms of uh, story structure, for sure. Mm, I guess I I've got a funny relationship between, I, I know you're going to unpack this more, James, but between what's a theme and what's a message. And I guess I've always been a little suspicious of stories where I feel like I can 
smell out the message too clearly and I, it feels like I'm being preached at instead of, I, I don't know, um, I like to draw a line that writers aren't philosophers. Uh, like I live with an academic philosopher, so I know what goes, like the toolkit that goes into academic philosophy and that's not the toolkit we're using. We, we take a theme, we explore it with conflict, as Matan said. We, um, we like to unpack and explore ideas, but it's not necessarily our job to philosophize. We're not going to solve the mysteries of the world with a fucking simile. But yeah, when, when I see writers, if I, if I can feel like I sense the message coming from a mile away, I, that no longer engages me, I guess, with the story. And then that's almost a failing of the dramatic form of the story. In my opinion. Yeah. Right off of what you said, like I'm in the same vein. And as you were saying that, like my mind started to try to put theme and message in two different buckets. I'm like, how do I separate those things? Like, what is what do those mean to me? And it's almost like maybe as an author, I aim to write with a theme and weave theme into the story. And then it's not my job to create the messages. Like mm. the reader will create the messages. Mm. And I think maybe that's the maybe that's the difference between doing it well versus like putting a message in. Like I know when I'm reading my stuff back, if I sense areas where like I can hear my own voice too clearly, I'm like, okay, that needs to be rewritten. That's not good. Hmm. But it's like, yeah, it's like you're writing with the humans and it's like you're putting the human condition in. It's like the theme or the message is the filter with which you're going to derive your characters from, but the theme should not be detectable in the characters. And then naturally how the characters interact messages will be born. It's like, Hmm you're setting up the petri dish with the theme and the message and then the stuff that grows from it will be just what the reader sees Mm. something like that Mm. wow yeah and the message of that comment that i just gave is no i don't know (laughs) (laughs) you guys make a really like legitimate point um i mean that'll make sense but some some writers are philosophers i think like if you've got something to say i don't think you need to be a philosopher i mean stuff like camo right Albert Camus, Albert Camus. Yeah. I don't know, but you know who I'm talking about. He he was a philosopher. And obviously, like that's at the far being a philosopher is like a, a spectrum almost, you know, and he is one. <laughs> You're a philosopher but, or a philosopher. Yeah, that's right. We're all philosophers. <laughs> but his stuff was like allegory. He had like in The Stranger. I don't know if you guys have read that. He had something yeah. very specific to say about individuality and how to maintain your individual integrity against a world that is necessarily trying to direct you. And I think if that was just a story, it would actually be a lot weaker. But he had something to say, and he wrote a story as a way of expressing it. And I can't think of like a more perfect argument for his message and his philosophy than that piece of fiction. Um, but, I, I, but I'm into that. You know, I'm, I'm really curious to see uh, what kind of messages you guys saw in stories, maybe stories I read, kind of see if you guys took a different messages. Mm-hmm. Well, that kind of brings me back to kind of like my closing statement on that, because we've all kind of pretty much touched on kind of everyone's got a slightly different attitude, but we've all kind of centered in on, on the same thing. In my opinion myself, like, no, they don't need a message, but yes, they also do. So I'm kind of like putting my feet in both sides of the of the fence. Because I don't think that every story needs uh, a lesson. I think that some stories could be just purely for entertainment. I think some horror stories are just about the scare. I think some love stories are just about the little cozy joy that you get from the two characters coming together at the end. Some revenge stories are just about the catharsis of seeing like the villain get it at the end. Mm. Um, however, while I don't think that every story needs a message, I do think that every reader is going to seek a message in the story. That we are essentially creatures of search for meaning and we have developed language and communication so that we can convey information even if you write a story that doesn't have a specific meaning that you intended i think people are going to interpret meaning from it Mm -hmm. so it was well to try and tie some kind of meaning into the story as you're telling it so at least you then have a little bit of control (laughs) about how it's interpreted that's a really good point yeah thank you (laughs) i did a bit of prep for this (laughs) (laughs) it shows (laughs) so yeah it's in your interest to try and tie a message in there but how do you do that without like coming across like you're lecturing or like you're moralizing ali like you said like if it's too obvious that like someone is trying to tell you something and phoenix if it's too obvious that like the writer's voice is there and they're kind of trying to directly tell you what it is that's going on we've all read those stories and probably as kids where it was kind of like a little moral story about how you're supposed to act in society like johnny finds money on the street and he wants to spend it on sweets but he decides to go and return it to the person who lost it in the first place and it's all very bland and it's all very obvious 
And the reason for that is that the message and the team haven't been separated. They're both the same thing. The team of the story is doing the right thing. And the message is that you should go and do the right thing. Mm. The best way of trying to convey these things in a way where they come across a bit more organically is like the town was saying, is to have the message play into your theme, be an extension of your team in some way. Whereas the team of the story is kind of like the broader subject that ties everything together or perhaps raises certain questions that are being asked throughout the story. The message is often either the answer to those questions or the team in action in a scene or through an action that the characters are performing. So what I wanted to do was ask you guys, can you think of any stories yourselves that had very strong messages or something that like really impacted you yourselves? And how was it that they were conveyed? How did they come across in the story? Why was it that they had such an impact? Yeah, I got yeah. one. The one that comes to my mind immediately is Coraline by Neil Gaiman. Um, so scary tale for kids, but I'm reading it. I'd seen the movie before and I was like, I want to read it as well. And I'm going through and I know what's coming. But then all of a sudden he kind of breaks the fourth wall and he actually does speak almost directly to the reader about overcoming fear and stuff like that. And it was very like message heavy. But the reason it landed very solidly for me was because it was like warranted. He had already done the work of setting up everything. The reader was already on the edge of their seat. They knew what was coming. They knew the significance. And then he just dropped it by like, now that I have you here. And he did it beautifully within the context of the story. He told a story of like, you know, it's one thing to go into a situation and have it turn out badly, but it's truly brave to go back into a situation knowing what's waiting for you. So it's like telling about you know, you get attacked by hornets and you drop your watch and then to go back into the hornet's nest to get your watch. That's where, I don't know, the bravery comes from. And so when Coraline's about to go back into the other world to save her parents, she had already escaped and seen the terror and she was willingly going back in. And it just really stuck with me. I'm like, ooh, that is true when you can do it a second time and hold yourself in it. It's really powerful. And it, it just, it was set up well and landed really nicely. I'm thinking of Slaughterhouse Five. I bring up Kurt Vonnegut Jr. all the time, but I'm really influenced by him. Ali, was it you that said like it's it feels kind of gross when the author just speaks to you directly and says this is the message? Yeah. I mean, yeah, it can feel really ham-fisted, but Kurt Vonnegut Jr. does that a lot. He's often just like, "Hey, I'm Kurt Vonnegut Jr. I'm going to talk to you right now." <laughs> yeah. And Slaughterhouse, yeah. Slaughterhouse <laughs> literally <laughs> names himself. Yeah. Or he puts himself in certain scenes, which yeah, is great. I don't know. I just think he does it so deftly. Maybe it's because. Like you were saying, Phoenix, like he earns it with the rest of the story. Mm. I think earning it is actually a big part. Like you've got to tell the really good story and then you almost have credibility to be able to speak and, and tell a message directly. I guess being clever in the way you say it helps as well. Mm. Yeah, no, I've been trying to think of an example to argue with myself. So, so last night I went and saw um, Penn and Teller Live which oh. was really fun. So I was kind of thinking of most recent um, examples because I, I truly believe they're storytellers first and kind of the craft of uh, live magic tricks is storytelling just with a different toolkit. And they do it really well. Um, so I was initially going to answer, oh, no, there, there's no messages in that. And then I'm like, oh, wait, hang on, there was. Their final kind of, they called it a stunt because they go out of their way to be like, this one's a stunt, this one's a trick. Um, so they ended their night with a um, fire breathing stunt from Penn, but he does it by telling this story of the first fire breather he ever saw when he was a child and why this is he got into doing it. And that same kind of awe that, you know, he got addicted to uh, wanting to share that with um, his audience. Um, but so interwoven into that beautiful story of his childhood, he, he had this very clear didactic message that was really relevant to kind of American politics at the moment. Uh, without saying that, but it was kind of wink, wink, nudge, nudged everyone in the room um, about people being okay with mystery in their lives. So his argument being people who are okay with mystery are the scientists in our world who love to admit that they don't know something, therefore they seek to find. But it's kind of being okay that you live in a universe where you don't know everything. And then he's directly comparing that to people who are not okay mm. with mystery and need answers to everything and will try and force an explanation for things, even if they have to invent something. 
but he kept bringing it back to the magic tricks and their craft and this idea that some there's an audience where people will still come and see live magic because they're okay with mystery and okay with the illusion of mystery. And then the people in the foyer that like to kind of mansplain and are like, oh, I know how he did the needle trick and then just invent some nonsense because they just, they need to know how they did the mm. trick. Wonderful, wonderful example of really didactic message about American politics tied into the craft of storytelling and magic tricks. And I, I actually really love that. So that's an example of like myself, me eating my own words in that I thought that was really well done. Mm. I think one of the examples that I thought, and I was racking my brain to think of a message book and I thought of a couple like uh, Lord of the Flies and Jurassic Park, but I think the one that really sticks with me the most um, is probably Atlas Shrugged by Ayn Rand, which is a very unpopular book right now. I was waiting the, for someone to bring up Ayn Rand. <laughs> yeah, given the, the current political climate. And I've heard it described as a book that's got these terribly flat characters, um, but that has just this such a strong, almost thesis, which is basically about personal empowerment when you really get down into it. It's just basically like one man against the world, which is <laughs> sounds kind of cheesy, but I, I don't know. I, I, I really, really kind of enjoyed it. And I still, I still enjoy it when I read it back. But yeah, that's, I think that's really this outlier because um, if, you, if you sort of listen to a few things that she said, she's like, I have this philosophy, like Patty was saying, I have this philosophy and I have basically used writing as a tool to put forth this philosophy. And in that way, some of the characters, this might be going a little off, off track, but some of the characters can come across as stilted, but I feel like it's almost in service to the message itself because these characters um, who are kind of, almost kind of cardboard cutouts, they become almost like archetypes of yeah. like the hero, the heroine, the, um, the, the weak man who, who is sort of forced into doing something that he doesn't really want to do. Um, the brave objectivist so we, industrialist who conquers yeah, the world with his mind. And his yeah. they're, they're like almost deliberately not real characters. It's such that they are in service to this, this uh, story and the story is then in service to the message. But for some reason, she's the only writer I've ever read who really can just be like, we're going here and this is going to be a vehicle for that. I guess that would be my example. Yeah, I kind of I get what you're saying with that because I just recently read The Fountainhead as well. Same thing. It's a book that ends with like a lengthy speech and the speech <laughs> kind of just sums up oh, yeah. why I did this. And because oh, all of the characters are very much just embodiments of ideas, it's kind of like, oh, this feels very concise and like this <laughs> makes a lot of sense now. But it's interesting that she describes herself. I get what you're saying by describing herself as a storyteller, not a philosopher. Or did you say a philosopher, not a storyteller? Me? Yeah. Um, I Because I oh, know she had a lot of critique of typical philosophy oh, book being she, about people she sitting described, around. Yeah, she described herself as a uh, using the story as a vehicle to, to explain her philosophy and being like, I couldn't oh. write it as a philosopher. I, it has to be fiction. Like, mm. this is... It's just who I am and this is how that's I... A, that's interesting. Yeah, yeah. I was going to say, because my, my kind of argument on that is, of course, writers can be philosophers. I just think story is the shit tool to do it well with. <laughs> but, I'm, I'm with Ali on this. It definitely can I'm, be. I'm, I'm with Ali on this. You know, call a horse a horse and a donkey a donkey. If you want to write a philosophy book, write a philosophy book. Yeah, um, I think, I think we, if you... If in order to get across proper ideas, it needs to be six philosophers exactly. sitting around discussing the philosophy. <laughs> <laughs> you, you know, uh, James, uh, I'll go back to what you said. I'm going to do a bit of a build up before I mention the book I'm going to talk about. I and I really loved what you said about uh, how whether you want it or not, the reader will usually find the message in mm. the story. And the book that I'm going to bring up has sold uh, 150 million copies, 100 of awards. Maybe some people don't consider it like peak prose, but uh, it's hard to argue that it has resonated with millions of people. And the message is quite on the nose in this one. And I'm referring to The Alchemist and how a um, lot of people seem to really vibe with it. Of course, yeah. there are many people that don't quite, don't feel like that's their cup of tea. I think almost anyone who liked The Alchemist will be very happy to sit down for five minutes and tell you exactly what the message is about. Yeah. Um, personally, as someone in camp, I like Alchemist. I think that the message, if you really distill it, is like pursue your personal legend. I suppose that's how the story puts it. 
like find your dream and just chase it. And if you zoom out and you look at the themes, it's about belief and hard work and that kind of stuff. But I really think it can be addictive for a reader to feel like they're figuring out the, the message for themselves. And I'm also going to attach what I think Ali mentioned is that you don't want the message to be like spelled out for you. You want to feel like it's a puzzle that you solve. That's mm. why people like to mm. do all these, you know, these puzzles in the newspaper. You want to feel like you got it, like you were given the yes. ingredients and you kind of made it yourself. And I think that's yeah, why the no, it, works. It's so leading good. a horse to water, right? Like I think, yeah, the reason I'm I'm saying I think it's a shit tool to to present your ideas is because it, yeah, it's that puzzle. You you can't convince someone. You're not going to win an argument by just telling them this is how it is you, you got a a story shines best when it's leading someone to that conclusion organically and you're not a part of um presenting the thesis in so many words they they need to be an active participant yeah they, they need to have their own agency in changing their own mind I don't think I've ever agreed I, I think the stories where I love messages are when I already agree with the message <laughs> I agree 100 with what Penn was saying last night so I had a great time I don't think Penn had, would successfully changed anyone's mind in the audience if they weren't already with him. Um, so I, that's why I don't think it's a great tool. I love what, what Matan was saying, essentially. The, the idea that the audience needs to be, they, they need to have that agency if they're going to change their own mind. What you're saying makes sense. But actually speaking of Atlas Shrugged, I had a very opposite experience to what you were saying. That, Like I was actually talking about this with James the other night. I was brought up in a very left-leaning socialist household right and i was surrounded by those ideas of you know like that kind of strong conquering individuality is not the right thing to do and you need to be communally minded all the time and i was given atlas shrugged by a friend with a sort of more libertarian bent and he said you know what keep an open mind and read this and i knew what it was going to be getting into it but i think the fact that it was fiction and it was pretty compelling in parts it changed I wouldn't say completely changed my mind about things, but it definitely opened me up to another set of political social arguments that I really hadn't embraced before. And I don't think if I was given that like message wrapped in fiction, I would have come to it when I did. Would you say that it planted some seeds? Yes, that's exactly it. Mm. Well put. Okay. Well yeah, put. That's, um, I feel like it, it, it 100%, I keep thinking, I just thought of this scene earlier, but like in Inception, it's fully, it's Inception. So it's like, it's the moment Inception where they're trying to think like, how do we convince this guy to mm. dissolve his father's business? We yeah. can't just say, dissolve your father's <laughs> business. We need to create a story around it so that he builds an emotional attachment mm. to it. And he totally. comes to that conclusion for himself. Yeah. So it's the same thing where it's like you have, it's like on the opposite end of a novel, you have like a quote where it's like, it's got to be zingy, sharp and fast. And then the opposite is like, all right, now we need to dilute that. And mm. what does it look like to dilute a sentence that becomes characters a world it becomes a sensation and you're mm. trying to communicate a feeling in the most like yeah if i need to it's like poetry is used to it's like the thing i'm trying to communicate to you is not a logical thought it's like i want you to feel a sensation i felt so how mm. do i talk about that i describe the gate by telling you the color red like it's like i need to give you what i felt mm. and like you get the person to come to the same conclusion you so uh, yeah. real quick uh, i really dig what phoenix says i just Going really back to the start, I don't think philosophy couldn't be conveyed in a book. I think it may be a question of should or shouldn't. If you if you are a philosopher, should you pursue fiction as your main vehicle, mm. or should you just sit down and write a philosophy book? Well, so I mean, I, I think, do think it's possible. Just... I mean, I think maybe that depends on the individual. Like, I I think maybe like taking philosophy as a totemic. This is philosophy. We are philosophizing. I am creating philosophy here, and it is not fiction. I think that might be a, a little bit of a, uh, a reductive view. Like, I know this sounds wishy-washy, but I feel like, yeah, I, I like the analogy of the seeds, like being able to um, plant and extrapolate on ideas through imaginative scenarios. Like, um, what's Proust's novel? Um, Something about time. I the, the Anyway, that basically is expounding on a bunch of different situations and different scenarios and and like taking them out and teasing them out and going mm -hmm. like okay well this is this and i had this conversation what did that mean and how did i feel about that and basically it's it's the author having a conversation with himself and look whether you could derive a philosophy quote unquote from that book is is kind of arguable but um certainly you know it makes you think 
Like, yeah. I, and I think that's what philosophy is at the end of the day. It's, it's something that makes you think. And, you know, I think there are different mediums in which that can, can be conveyed in different different levels and different layers. That's, I guess, what, what my yeah. thoughts are. No, I think we're all circling on a, a similar consensus. Like, I love what Phoenix said, the idea that I think stories, like we share emotions, we, we can mm. share experiences and perspectives. I guess it's the ideas, the very high intellectual kind of concepts you need mm. to communicate through those other tools, through emotions, get yeah. lead people there first. And if they just happen to arrive at the high concept ideas, everyone wins. But if, if that's your leading foot, like you have, yeah, like Ayn Rand just stands out as the exception to being able to do this, I think. Absolutely. But, yeah. Um, it's, it's hard to I'm teach exception. something through fiction, you know? I think that's, I think we can all agree with that. It's hard to teach someone how to build an airplane through a story. <laughs> <laughs> Is that a challenge? Challenge, challenge accepted. That's, that's yeah. a challenge, challenge for you, Tom, <laughs> personally. No, because I, I, I didn't like that tone. <laughs> We're learning a lot about whaling from Moby Dick. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Absolutely. That's going to come in handy. Okay, uh, guys, build a raft and meet me in the coast of Perth uh, on the 6th of uh, July. We're going whaling. <laughs> Read Moby Dick. Finish Moby Dick before you come. Yeah. Oh man, I'm gonna get the audiobook. I'm not the making it through the text. <laughs> right. I'm drowning. The whale book. I just want to jump back to what we were saying about seas because that is pretty much what I think a message in a book does. That it doesn't necessarily change your mind or necessarily communicate a big idea, but it plants the seed mm. of a larger idea that you might then kind of discover yourself. My own probably favorite message that was delivered in a story it's probably from philip k dick's book do androids mm. dream of electric sheep mm. which is a book about a, a guy who was chasing down like runaway clones who what do you think the book. message there was oh i'll get to it um <laughs> curious <laughs> <laughs> because the theme of the story was like what is it to be human because the character is spending a good portion of the story asking himself what is the difference between himself as a living person and these clones who he is essentially executing if they engage in life in like almost all of the same ways and towards the end of the book and i kind of hesitate to say it in case of spoilers so just heads up to anyone who hasn't read the book i was, um, it came out in the 60s you're all good <laughs> yeah towards the end of the book there is a scene from the perspective of a side character who is spending time with the clones unaware that that's what they are the clones have all come down from mars and they haven't seen any like animals on earth and there isn't that many animals on earth because the world is broken and stuff and they come across a spider and there is a scene where the clones trap the spider and pick the legs off it out of curiosity to see how it will respond but the pov character like sitting there absolutely horrified and it's a really really striking scene because it kind of answers the question that has been being asked throughout the story mm. but it doesn't come right out and say it mm. later on in the story the character is speculating about the religion that has come over the time and an awful lot of the religion is based on empathy and how empathy joins people together so if you were by yourself able to connect those dots the question is Anything that was man-made, any kind of machine or any kind of clone or any kind of something that came into existence outside of a natural process doesn't have empathy and didn't have compassion. And that was why it needed to be destroyed. And that was why it was separate, ah. from, separate from everything else. But you see, I almost took a different message. I almost took the message of like human children have done this. This is a sign of human curiosity. Mm. You know, I'm going to do something and see what happens. And I took it in a completely different direction. Like, oh, I guess, I guess they are like us because we're kind of fucked too, you know. <laughs> but, uh, but it's interesting. And I kind of love that. How my mind, yeah, yeah, yeah. and my, my mind Beauty. jumped into a different direction. Yes. And then the author's like, yes, yeah, so that's why we need to destroy them. But we are empathetic, which is kind of bullshit. But okay, <laughs> no, yeah, I, I love it. I really love this. That's that's great to hear the difference. Yeah, mm. there you go. That's, that's an example of two readers drawing different meanings to drawing different messages from the same the same story mm -hmm. which means it probably wasn't too didactic like there's yeah. enough of a playground happening in the story that yeah you can still have a good time and you're still doing the audience thing of trying to puzzle it out mm -hmm. um yeah. which in my mind is a successful narrative definitely yeah definitely That's rather kind than of an essay thing. <laughs> yeah but yeah that is the wonderful thing about the art forms that everyone can have their own uh, mm. and get something else out of it which i love how many times have you heard and maybe none, but I've encountered this a lot. Lord of the Rings described as a very definite allegory for mechanized warfare, the First World War, and industrialization in Europe. As I've heard I that mean, said. Uh, I would definitely have heard that it was inspired by the events of World War One, because I know Tolkien began writing it while he was 
in the trenches. Mm. So I definitely understand the depiction of the evil side being so bad from, from that Fires perspective. of industry. Mm. And this... I kind of understand his, how he kind of, the story isn't about good triumphing over evil. It's almost evil destroying itself in nature. the end. Mm. Nature. I, I felt like it's almost like nature versus the natural versus the unnatural, where you got the, the orcs, of course, is, and Sauron, the destroying forests and all that stuff. And eventually nature kind of overcomes and balance is restored. But Lord of the Rings is fascinating because uh, so many people took it in different directions. I think there has been, please correct me if I'm wrong. There has been some backlash from the author saying that it isn't an allegory to That was going to be my point. He always said that it's I absolutely not said that. a message that mm -hmm. anything you're reading into it is false. Um, yeah. But can you live through that and write a book that is untainted by it? Oh, Does he you? really know that there's no message? Just because he didn't intend one, mm -hmm. he was living at a certain time, certain mm -hmm. themes came through whether he liked it or not. The author can say that there's no message, but it doesn't mean he's right. <laughs> and th this can also be the same thing of like, he could unknowingly be creating a message, but also the readers could be like, we know what you went through. I'm going to attach this message to it. Like it yeah. could be projected mm. on the reader's side as well. It definitely feels like industrialization is a huge enemy in it. Like they, it's just right there. And like deforestation, mm. creation of these war machines and things like that. Like it's an aspect, whether or not it's, meant to be part of the message or not it's it's in there uh, i think something very similar happened with um fahrenheit 451 oh but that was definitely didactic right but yeah. is that not that intended to be feels there, like there is a scene where the villain kind of explains himself or not the villain but jaman's boss kind of explains why they burned books and why they did everything and i believe the author turned around and was like it wasn't meant to be about that i just wanted to give the villain like a strong motivation <laughs> but that became like one wow. of the defining themes of the book yeah victim yeah. of his own success almost and making a far too three-dimensional villain <laughs> <laughs> That's a weird thing because it's like, I don't know if you can do that as an author because it's like, it's misdirection and you're telling the reader where to look. So if you're going to have your major villain, which is the force that the reader is trying to overcome, say, this is the thing I stand for, like that becomes what the reader is like, oh, this is our focal point. Like, I don't know if you can say, I don't think you can separate those two of like, I just wanted to give my villain a strong motivation, but I didn't want that to be part of the message. Like, yeah. it's pretty hard for at the very, okay, I'm not going to say you can't do that. But do not be surprised if your readers yeah. walk away with that. Yeah. yeah. May I quickly ask something of the group? Like how many of us start our story knowing what the theme is and how many of us discover it either along the way or like at the pointy end of editing? Because I feel like I'm probably more on the I work it out as I'm going or it's only quite my own theme only becomes apparent to me when I'm at the end. Um so, so it is mining our own core beliefs, but we're not going in planning to preach it. I, I go in planning I, uh, to preach it. <laughs> okay, well, I, I often maybe have a that's very why strong... we're at odds. <laughs> yeah, I, well, I, I mean, think, but there's nothing I wrong think, with that. Like we, I think, you know, we just, that's right great. From I'm just going to cut in really quickly. I think that there is a message which inspires the story and you write the story and then you figure out the theme as you're writing the story. Okay. Is that, um, does that feel like it happens to either of the two of you? Yes. Okay. I felt like I, in the current novel I'm working on, I felt like I had this very clear message that I, I really had it this way. Like, like you're saying, I had this message in my mind and the themes are going to hop on. But really, as, as I went into it and I found characters that weren't part of this original message, but I really cared about and the conflict developed. I feel like that message changed naturally. It didn't disappear, but it did change. And I feel like once I finish it, then I'll almost let my my readers tell me what is, what is their message for the story? Because uh, I'm not interested in giving people a message. I'm really curious to see the messages they will find. Yeah. I just found this getting um, some feedback from my story that I did and James actually edited it and he he really pulled out a bunch of different things that I was like, I'd, I'd sort of hinted at and like, I'm a big believer in writing from the subconscious, like just like, ah, just vomit it up and, you know, figure out and then post the gem later. And like a lot of the things that he came through, that, that went through, was like, oh, you've got these two places here. One is like a, an evil corrupted place and another is actually a sacred space. And he's like, you've actually pointed to this one being corrupted and this one being the sacred space. But the, the fun thing is that there's a flip. And when that triggered, when that like kind of popped off and I was like, 
oh, <laughs> it opens up a whole different side. It's like, okay, now I can write about these whole bunch of people and like this, and then that ties back to that backstory. So it's almost like I'll, I'll just go through it and be like, okay, I mean, it's, there's a thing that's happening here, and then, okay, I'm done. And then it's almost like I need someone else to go through it and go like, well, you've done this here and that there, and that connects to that in that way. And I'm like, right, okay, cool. And then I can go back and finish it off and mm. polish it. So that's been my experience with post-posthumous messaging mm. in a book, I guess. Yeah. That's whether we like it or uh, not, the things we believe and think are going to come through in our writing. It's so yeah, personal. Alex is like the king of, of pantsing. And I got to say, <laughs> I, Alex, I Alexed a chapter the other day, and it was so much fun. I just, I Alexed it. I just, just blasted went in. I had, I had no idea what's going to happen. I was a bit nervous. You know, I, I was sitting there. It was a bit awkward, you know. But <laughs> Alex does a verb now. I feel all the time. <laughs> Pantsing is not pulling down someone's pants. Pantsing is a writing style. <laughs> Contrary to planning, we have a whole podcast episode on it. It was all question that happened. Listener decides what pantsing is. It's a lot of fun. It's a lot of fun. Yeah, I was just going to say that I definitely seem to find the theme as I'm writing it. And then I will stop and ask myself, like, why did I write this? Like, what was the idea behind why I put this together? Mm. And can I connect that to the theme or in the process of writing it, has it turned into something else? And there won't be a message. I'll just leave it as the theme. Mm. I think a lot of people tend to find their theme as they go, maybe after the first draft. Mm. Paddy, did you have a reading? Yeah, I do. This is something where I had some specific ideas I wanted to deal with and some specific things I wanted to convey, but I didn't want to outright state it because yeah, it can feel a bit gross to just say like, this is what I believe. And it is fun as a reader to just be able to explore. So I'm not going to tell you guys what I think it's about. I'm a big fan of the music of Tool. Right. And like, I think Maynard James came in the tool said like once, like, yeah, I know what it's about, but it doesn't matter what I think it's about. What you get out of it is more important. And yeah. writing poetry is interpretive. Anyway, this story is called The Fall of Behemoth. And for context, uh, Behemoth, Ziz and uh, Leviathan are these mythical creatures from Hebrew mythology. And they're really big beasties. Okay. Chapter one of Behemoth, what we might assume. Who was that ancient king? Who succeeded in slaying Behemoth. Let us lay out our assumptions. First, we can assume by its absence that it was slain. It seems absurd to assume it died by sickness or misadventure. That singular being that had existed since Earth's first solid ground had cooled from the primordial chaos of molten stone. For it to then have perished by accident within the brief span of human existence seems unlikely. Unlikely also that it is still alive, hidden somewhere in some unseen corner of the world. Nearly every place on dry land is now known to us, and the likelihood it could harbor such a conspicuous entity diminishes every day. Second, we assume that it was slain on the proclamation of a king. Who else could marshal the scale of human might necessary to do the deed? It could, of course, have been a queen, but for the purposes of this account, we will say king. If nothing else, the one has been more frequent than the other, owing to the power our species male has held over its counterpart ever since the first enclosing walls were raised around cities. And who but a monarch? or one who commanded with a similar power, would dare attempt to slay Behemoth, in which by its sheer existence, the very hand of creation was implied. Of course, we don't imagine the king himself striking the final blow. Tens of thousands must have labored to bring the killing to its culmination. But as events plummet away from us in time, the tendency is for details to blur into one, as a scattering of objects would if we pulled away from them, until, finally turning, we would see just a single dot in the far horizon, and perhaps the shape of the largest of them. Dates, names, and finer facts vanish to leave a single date, a single name, a single presiding fact. The details of the slaying have so contracted until we remember only this, that Behemoth was, and now is not. But to have lost our recollection of such a monumental deed, why? How did we forget? Perhaps it is the long shadow the beast's own name still casts in our imagination, such that the names of its slayers, who were, after all, only mortal, were simply eclipsed. Though with some deep ancestral shame of it still remains, and now unconscious knowing that we carry with our past a sacrilege nearly without parallel, a doing that can never be undone, then perhaps the forgetting was a practical thing. Whatever the case, the effect is the same. The names fell away, one by one, from the stories, until only the name of the beast remained. How ironic it is, then, that the king who sought immortality in slaying it is forgotten, while the thing destroyed remains. And that seems like a fine place to stop. I, I forgot how good it is. Yeah, yeah I love that. Thank you. Yeah. 
It was a Boston to write. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was, a, it was a joy to read. Yeah. I think it's a very beautiful piece of work. I remember when you read it at the writer's group and while listening, I was just like, damn, that's good. Like, <laughs> that's good. It, it was actually really unpleasant to write. The Leviathan <laughs> bit just made me so anxious and in the best way. Yeah. Cool. You haven't read it now. He hasn't read it now. The Leviathan mm -hmm. stuff. That's can, very we, can, we, can we refer to these beasts as Jewish kaiju? Or is that... <laughs> I don't see what, why are we not? I love that so much. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly okay, what it because, is. Uh, okay, let's let's trademark the thing. Okay. <laughs> and we'll make an anime about it. You totally could too. You please, totally please. Could. Please. I was watching a lot of Attack on Titan at the time when, when I wrote this. <laughs> yeah. At Attack of Titan and listening to Tool. <laughs> yeah. Nice. Wow. All right, Phoenix, did we have a quote from you? Yes. This is this is vaguely related to allegory and where it fits in a story but it's just or a quote from c.s lewis talking about tolkien's work lord of the rings no imaginary world has been projected which is at once multifarious and so true to its own inner laws none so seemingly objective so disinfected from the taint of an author's merely individual psychology none so relevant to the actual human situation yet free from allegory and what fine shading there is in the variations of style to meet the almost endless diversity of scenes and characters, comics, homely, epic, monstrous, or diabolic. That's quite cool. high praise. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I like the, the, taint, <laughs> the taint of the author's psychology. That sounds like exactly what you were talking about. Yeah. Yeah. The, the stank yeah. of the author. Being <laughs> <laughs> it works with the message. You try and shake that rug out, but you yeah. just can't. Uh, uh, yeah. That's a good quote. That's yeah. cool. I read it like a few times when I first opened the book. I was like, whoa, thanks, C.S. Lewis. That's amazing. <laughs> You're a pretty good writer too. This guy, yeah, yeah, yeah. We should write a book. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. This is not commentary about how the Chronicles of Narnia developed. Okay. I've never read it. I should. I, mean, I should read it. First five are great. Okay. How many are there? Says, <laughs> are there seven? On a scale of wheel the time. He just, <laughs> wheel the time. <laughs> he just, yeah, he yeah. just skips timeline. Okay, but we'll save this for the next podcast. Sequels and when to stop. Yeah, maybe we should do that. We should do omnibuy, omnibuses, whatever the mm. plural is. That could be fun. All right. So in closing, <laughs> if you have a story that you've been writing and you don't have a message, don't worry about it. Not every story needs a message. It isn't terribly difficult to tie one in. If you think about your team and think about how your team resolves or the questions of your team, you can easily write a message in at the end of your story. And if you have a message and you don't have a story that you started writing, start writing it. <laughs> I've been James Healy. Thank you for listening. This has been Pros and Cons. Goodbye. Bye. Goodbye. Yeah. You're listening to Pros and Cons, the Prespice Fiction Podcast.